Hello, everyone. And uh, yeah, perfect. I'll have control over my slides. So as Akhtar mentioned, um, I'm going to discuss uh, understanding of uh, deep neural networks uh, at Signify. I'm doing data science and engineering, kind of a mixed profile. And yeah, you can read more about it or connect on LinkedIn. So at Signify, we um, putting a lot of emphasis on sustainability. Uh, this year, uh, we get uh, quite a nice achievement. We are 100% carbon neutral company. I think that's amazing considering all the climate uh, change uh, issues that we are facing these days. And the growth areas uh, for us uh, is the following. So in the climate action, for example, we're contributing with the highly efficient LEDs and the solar energy in circular economy. It's mostly uh, 3D printing examples. Uh, we have a horticulture proposition for the food availability, urban connected lighting for safety and security, and for the health and well being. I think that's uh, something that's really relevant these days. It's a UVC lighting for disinfection. And uh, we have a smart lighting for home, uh, Hue ecosystem. And uh, let's say, a uh, human-centric lighting proposition for uh, offices called Nature Connect. Quite amazing thing that can provide, let's say, a sky view <laughs> for your office. Um, I'm really passionate about that. So you can imagine that we have quite amount of uh, different data to work with, and uh, we're doing a lot of modeling. And we also have a lot of stakeholders that are asking a question, and here comes uh, the explainability. So why? In general, uh, we need explainability tools. So first of all, uh, if we take, let's say, uh, most critical applications such as healthcare, self-driving, or military, which directly uh, impacting human lives, then uh, the question of uh, how exactly the models are doing the decision, how they're supporting us, it's, uh, it's quite uh, open and relevant. And if we take into account that the majority of the algorithms that uh, behind of this application is neural networks and deep neural networks, which are uh, treated as a black box usually, uh, then it makes it even more important, right? So uh, we always raising concerns and interest about that. There's a lot of discussion about gender or race bias, uh, adversarial examples that can break uh, image classification networks and uh, yeah, uh, ruin your uh, self-driving car. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, ethical concerns and uh, in general, whether we can trust the decision, right? If we, if we get some kind of uh, diagnosis uh, or you, your uh, loan application was rejected because of um, yeah, some random forest, I don't know. Yeah, you would like to know why, right? It's, uh, you would like to know uh, particular explanation for your case. And also, I think uh, another driving factor is uh, curiosity. We are all quite curious and would like to know how exactly this complex model uh, are working. And to help us, there's this whole field these days called uh, ex explainable AI or XAI. Uh, I personally don't like AI term. I think it's for uh, marketing people, but yeah, if you use machine learning, it will be XML and make some more confusion, okay, XAI. This tool, this field basically allows us to uh, use some methods and tools and solve all these uh, problems with explanations. Um, yeah, let's take a step uh, back. So yeah, well, I'm using log logistic regression, for example, right? I mean, it's quite, explainable model, why I need all these tools. Uh, indeed, there's a set of uh, machine learning models that are quite explainable. However, there's a cases when um, on the first glance, highly explainable model may become way less explainable. You can think about uh, K-nearest neighbors classifier, right? I mean, if your feature space is super small, then, well, yeah, you probably can explain it, but then if you have like, I don't know, thousands of features, then probably you need something else uh, rather than just the plots. And another problem that uh, we are usually facing is that simple models, uh, they perform 
poor and you start using some complex models. But then when you're uh, using a complex models, uh, they're difficult to explain to your customers, right? So that's kind of a paradox. And then you need these tools again. Uh, if you look for the scientific articles on explainability, uh, there's a quite uh, a rising trend, I would, I would say. Uh, like a few few days ago, actually, there was also another uh, nice paper released for like that's doing a lot of uh, overview of, of these methods. So yeah, it's a diff becoming a difficult to catch up with uh, these things. Uh, but these uh, articles mostly focused on the following things. So a part of the like, new methods uh, that are developed, there's also important concept of notions or uh, requirements and characteristics that you would like. Uh, uh, to impose on these methods. Let's say, what in general, the question, what is the good explanation for your model? What do you want to have? A plot, a graph, a scheme of rules. So I think uh, these notions, they come a bit forward and then the methods trying to satisfy these requirements. And obviously there's a lot of uh, systematic reviews and uh, benchmarks of the existing methods. Let's deep dive into the methods itself. So. For the methods, we have um, that kind of taxonomy, um, the simple, simple things uh, to explain, let's say it's uh, IO, input, output, and output format. It's mostly standard numerical data, textual, time series, and output can be whatever you designed. Let's say uh, it could be mixed output, it could be numerical or rules. Um, in terms of the problem type, it's mostly classification or uh, regression in a supervised setting. Uh, there are some models and attempts for unsupervised one, uh, but I will not uh, use them in a production, I would say environment. It's just still, uh, let's say, um, first attempts. Uh, important thing to mention is uh, scope and the stage. This is something that uh, really uh, we need to discuss in detail. So uh, first I will start with scope. It could be local or global. And the local scope uh, method state trying to address an individual point of your data set. So let's say Bob is coming to the, to the bank to get a loan and he was refused by amazing machine learning model that was deployed and he's asking why. And then that local uh, methods, they can explain why uh, that happened, what kind of features contribute to that. And uh, that's particularly useful when you're dealing with uh, separate examples. Another uh, methods are global. They mostly giving you an idea of the whole uh, model performance based on your, uh, based on the group of, of data points. And uh, yeah, they're generating explanations for that. Another thing is the stage when you're applying these methods. So there's an intrinsic or anti hoc methods that they take explainability in mind. A good example of it could be that you're optimizing your neural network, not only for your performance features, but for some um, explainability metric altogether, uh, which, uh, which makes this uh, particular methods less transferable from one particular model to another. Uh, but yeah. Still, there's a quite uh, some chunk of the of these methods uh, on the graph, and I think the most popular one is uh, post hoc methods that applied afterwards. So you have your model, you would like to explain something, and these methods they're trying to directly explain your results or mimic the behavior of your model uh, and explain the results. I think that the power uh, within like the method that I would like to use is probably something that can explain both local and the global scope. Uh, post hoc, obviously, and uh, another classification that's also present on the slide, it's, uh, yeah, whether it's model agnostic or model specific, and I would say, yeah, model agnostic methods are uh, more in favor. If you are new in this uh, topic of explainability, there's one particular um, method that I would like to recommend if you're just starting, it's called uh, SHAP. It stands for Shapley Additive Ex uh, Explanations. And why this method? Uh, because it's based on a solid theory. So you can actually explain uh, the results quite good. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but in general, it's based on the Shapley values, which is the concept from uh, game theory that allows you to specify 
uh, attribution of your features and how they influence in the model. So another thing, this method allows you to look at the local scope. So this particular uh, graph here showing that how the feature driving model performance from some base value to particular model output. They also have some methods for uh, neural networks, um, mostly visualization wise uh, for the gradients. You can also see the global uh, view of your uh, of your features, which I think kind of makes this method is also global partially. And uh, another nice part is it also supports like traditional explainability methods uh, such as uh, partial dependency plots. So it's also super useful to see how your model behaving and using this. So you can find it on uh, Scott Landberg uh, GitHub repository. So highly recommended to start with this. Uh, now let's go to the explanation of uh, deep neural networks, uh, particularly. So for deep neural networks, there's a, some taxonomy, but it's it's like similar that what I already said. But I'll just want to go into detail. So there's the three main uh, groups of methods. The uh, first one is the visualization, uh, when you basically have your uh, input image, let's say, and you're trying to visualize how uh, predictions of your neural network uh, are influenced by, by, by your input. So you're trying to compose some kind of scientific visualization for your input. Uh, this is something that we're going to look into detail uh, during tutorial. And um, another thing is uh, distillation. So it's mostly uh, when you're trying to use some kind of white box model to mimic the input-output behavior of your uh, complex neural network. Let's say you have a uh, decision tree or uh, SVM, something like that. Uh, decision tree is more popular, I think. And then you're just uh, getting inputs, inputs and outputs of your neural network. And on these inputs and outputs, you're training your decision tree. And decision tree is explainable model. So you can use it to um, facilitate requirements of your customers. And another thing that I already mentioned, it's an intrinsic one when you incorporate the uh, optimization of uh, performance metric and the quality metric straight away. Uh, for visualization methods, uh, they, they also uh, different in the nature. So a quite extensive uh, classification, I would say. Uh, first type, it's a back propagation based when you're using a gradient uh, information that uh, uh, inside of the weights of the neural network uh, to uh, generate this uh, visualization. And another one, it's a perturbation based when you're changing your input, usually occluding it with some kind of kernel on top. And you trying to estimate like, okay, uh, how a model performing uh, on this changed input uh, compared to the original input. And uh, yeah, back propagation methods uh, in general, I mean, this whole idea sounds for me like this picture when, um, yeah, how we can explain machine learning models, yeah, we'll just use more machine learning and we'll be good with that. A bit of a recursion here, I think. But yeah, a bit of more practical problems. So this is a really nice example from the Pascal uh, VOC data set. Um, the problem here is quite uh, interesting. Uh, this data set contains a lot of picture that was uh, labeled as a horse class, let's say, that particular one. However, if you try to visualize some kind of using one of these methods uh, for visualization, uh, where exactly model is looking for, and you will find out that that's this heat map is looking on this watermark. And uh, that's the big problem, because if you remove this watermark and you provide a picture that contains the horse, you will not get the prediction of the horse anymore. And even more worse, that if you add it to some kind of artificially generated image, uh, it will predict that as a horse. So I think that this is the something, something that needs to be uh, validated or uh, checked at the stage of model development. So um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you some uh, methods that can, uh, you, can, you can incorporate for that. So in order to follow the tutorial, you need to go on this uh, GitHub link, and then click uh, for opening uh, collab uh, yeah, page. And then uh, you will see something like this. So let me see if I can, yeah. So in this tutorial, we're going to use um, 
Captum framework, which is PyTorch based. Uh, there's also TensorFlow alternative for those who are using TensorFlow extensively. Uh, and I also put the link for the algorithms explanations because I cannot go in detail or for each of them. So yeah, what I'm going, doing here is mostly I'm installing the, this uh, Captum framework and yeah, I'm getting some ImageNet class index to just understand uh, what kind of uh, classes are there and their mapping and the load, downloading some test images. You can then later on vary and pick something else. Uh, here, standard imports, nothing fancy. Uh, the most important part, I think it's uh, this one. So there are some methods for uh, attribution and particularly we focus yeah, on several gradient one and then also occlusion one. So in terms of preparation, uh, it's purely standard thing. So just opening this class index to understand the uh, index to labels mapping. I'm using ResNet 50 pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, and then also defining some transforms for specifically for this model, uh, resize, uh, conversion to tensors, and also normalization uh, according to the ImageNet. And uh, yeah, I'm doing a opening this amazing picture with the cat that you saw on the slide and also uh, doing a forward pass through the neural network and getting top three predictions. So I think it's quite useful to have five of them because sometimes uh, this model are not perf performing really well. So yeah, in our case, it's a good Simon's cat. I think it's a quite a straightforward example and easy to understand. And there's some visualization function that based on the uh, captum as well, I just put some parameters uh, to simplify the code a bit. So the first uh, group of methods, as I mentioned, is a back propagation ones. And the simple thing that you can do is uh, just uh, return the gradient of uh, your output with respect to the input. It's a quite noisy uh, approach, I would say, that you can see here that I'm doing that. So initializing the silency model, and then it goes directly just providing the, your input, predicting uh, uh, label index that you want, that uh, for which you want to find the attribution and the visualization to the other things. So even though you may say that this heat map is quite good because yeah, it's kind of like a contour of the cat and the mask image looks really well, but it's quite noisy in the nature. So the silency maps was introduced quite a long time ago. Um, another method called input times uh, gradient. Uh, this one is an extension of silency approach. Uh, what it's doing is that the same thing, gradient of the, uh, output with respect to input, but also you're multiplying it by the input features. And it's a bit better. So you see that it's less noisy. You still have a contour of the, of the cat. Um, yeah, keep in mind again that this picture is uh, yeah, far from the real use cases because this background is almost the same. So uh, yeah, it's uh, not a surprise that they're performing that good. Um, another method called guided back propagation so this is a bit, again, extension of uh, silency maps, I would say. Uh, here you're just uh, imposing some rule on uh, ReLU activation function. So it's uh, only uh, backpropagate non-negative gradients. So, and here you can see that it's getting like uh, a, bit, a bit better results. So uh, it's really now uh, showing the features that, okay, why this cat is, a, is, a, is that type, same as cat. Why is that? So it's really focusing on the head of the cat. And um, another one uh, called uh, guided grad cam, uh, another extension of the method, which is now focusing not only, I think I'm supposed to have a picture here, but uh, yeah, probably it's uh, get lost somewhere on the way. Um, on GitHub, there should be a picture there. So, um, uh, the thing is that this method is uh, looking also uh, to the gradient of the output with respect to some internal layers of your network. So here you can see that I'm providing like a layer four. It's like in the ResNet 50, the latest group of uh, convolutions. And uh, together with this uh, particular um, 
feature maps. It's also using uh, a guided back propagation altogether, upsampling the results and getting even better uh, results. So if you take these images and zoom in, compare that one with this one, this is less noisy. So what you can do at this point in time, if you're training new, uh, let's say, object detection, image classification models, uh, you can just incorporate this uh, image generation on your typical training cycle, right? So you can just use it by the end of each epoch, uh, generating these pictures just to see where the model is looking at. Uh, you will be so surprised sometimes. Uh, another group of methods, because for some people, uh, all these uh, tricks with the gradient sounds a bit like, uh, mm, well, I need something, um, I need something more uh, solid, something uh, less connected to gradients because it's uh, kind of like sounds not that stable and uh, not that robust. Uh, you can try perturbation-based methods. Uh, this one actually uh, nice alternative. So I uh, suggest you also to use it. Let's say uh, together with the uh, backpropagation one. And what the core idea, as I already mentioned, you just uh, occluding your, um, for example, in particular in occlusion model, you're occluding your uh, input with, um, with some kind of kernel, uh, with a sliding window here, I'm using 60 by 60 sliding window with some stride, and it will generate predictions for each of the uh, occlusion examples and then compare it with the baseline to see, let's say, which particular one are really affecting the score. And you can get, the, the, let's say, example like this. It can be tunable and yeah, used uh, also in the training cycle as well. So um, uh, this is kind of the basics, I would say, uh, that uh, you can get from this tutorial. Uh, I also include here at the beginning some other methods like uh, feature ablation and feature permutation. I suggest you to take a look uh, at the Captum library and to see how these methods can uh, suit you. So let's go back to the slides. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. So just a few words about the references, right? So when you're faced in a situation when you need to explain your models and uh, uh, given an idea, let's say on some like basic level, I would say that you can try sharp and uh, use it. Uh, let's say if you're deep in the computer vision uh, research or industrial research, whatever, I highly recommend to look at two uh, recent CVPR and ICCV uh, workshop sections. They have quite nice perturbation-based uh, models that uh, can even help you to identify adversarial examples. So that's something that uh, I'm currently exploring and using. It's uh, amazing. I put the links on this uh, slide. I will also share it afterwards. And yeah, if you, you can also read systematic reviews. They are produced almost every month and they always like updated. And I think it's quite nice if you just would like to see the whole field and you don't know what, uh, uh, what kind of models are there and stuff like that. Uh, and there's also some practical examples for uh, TensorFlow and yeah, you can use Captum if you're using PyTorch. So that's more or less it. Uh, I hope that this talk will make your models more explainable to your stakeholders and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Awesome talk. Thanks a lot, Vladimir. I, and I see this topic being more and more and more important on every conference uh, I'm attending. So thanks for addressing this. Uh, we do have questions. And uh, uh, first thing is, uh, do you have methods that also work well for one dimensional data? And for example, time series data. Uh, I think uh, there's, um, let's say, uh, model agnostic methods uh, that can be applied also to the time series data as well. I personally uh, didn't use it myself, but there is an implementation for time series data as well. Right. And I have a question myself. Um, when I look at model explainability, for me, there are two sides of things. One is that when you are evaluating the model on your notebook and then also another phase when you go into an operational mode. Do you have any uh, like advice or specialized tool that looks into that? Because the model is changing if you have, for example, continuous training enabled 
are how do you deal with that right now well uh, i would say that uh, there's a standard monitoring tools right for for the machine learning model in uh, production so uh, you can of course uh, incorporate one of these explainability tools as a part of this monitoring tools let's say and just monitor it as any normal any other metric right so if you get an adversarial example uh, for your image classification model uh, you can monitor the masks uh, of one of the method that i mentioned previously and you see if something changed then that's the signal but i think it varies from uh, let's say uh, field to field right so it's different for nlp it's also different for computer vision so it's like i don't know the particular uh, names that can be uh, directly plugged in into production setting. Uh, but I think like this general uh, frameworks for TensorFlow and PyTorch that provide explainability can be incorporated quite easily. So just the same code base. Right. And we have another question on Discord uh, from Juan. Uh, how do you explain the stake uh, to the stakeholder what is a sharp value? Ah, well, I can use this uh, amazing example with the picture of, uh, uh, with the pile of money and then uh, go with whole explanation, like how you will uh, split this money between the participants. I think this analogy will work uh, quite well for product owners and uh, stakeholders. <laughs> so. Right. Well, we have a comment on that. It's like red push up and blue push down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so cool. And um, yeah, uh, engage on Discord. And uh, also, yeah. uh, I know you already shared your links uh, for the code base over there, but I also encourage that in this, if you have some time, uh, check out uh, Vladimir's notebook and uh, give it a go.